Good evening and welcome to the April 10, 2024 regular meeting of the Holland City Council. I'm Mayor Nathan Box and I'm calling this meeting to order. Brenda, would you please call the roll? Yes. Bird. Present. Freeman. Present. Raymond. Here. Corbin. Here. Soul. Present. Rowan. Present. Shea. Here. Schulteis. Present. Mayor Box. Present. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. We're going to begin this meeting, uh, this evening's meeting, as we have for many years, uh, first with an opening prayer, followed immediately by the Pledge of Allegiance, and we would invite you to join us if you're so inclined. Please join me in prayer if you're so inclined. Lord, thank you. Thank you for beautiful, <laughs> and, and not the answer I was looking for, Lord, but that's, that's great. Um, thank you for beautiful sunny days. Thank you for spring days. Thank you for the promise that it brings for the summer and warmer weather ahead. Lord, you have entrusted us to do the work of this city. Give us ears to listen, brains to think, and may the words of our mouth be pleasurable to you. In your name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item are our consent agenda items. These are items that are considered to be fairly routine and they have been reviewed by council as part of our packet and they will be enacted in one motion unless a member of the public or a member of council asks to have an item removed from the consent agenda and then it will be placed in its regular order on the regular agenda. But before I ask that, Brenda, would you please review the consent agenda for us? Yes. 4B, approval of minutes, March 2024 regular and March 20. 27 2024 study session 4c oaths of office 4d tax abatement pa 198 for hg medical usa llc 4e annual license renewals for 2024 25 4f the tulip time festival approval of 2024 contract 4g a sign request recognizing the Capon House 150th anniversary. 4-H, Lakeview School Park Water Service Hookup. 4-I, set a public hearing for Holland Energy Fund budget for May 1, 2024. 4-J, the fiscal year 2024 strategic plan and business plan, quarterly progress report. 4K, revocable license agreement for 182 South River Avenue, projecting sign and lamps. 4L, revocable license agreement 184 South River Avenue, projecting sign. And 4M, the Allegan County 2023 Imagery Partnership Agreement. Great, thank you, Brenda. Is there any member of the public that would like to have an item removed from the consent agenda and placed in its regular order on the regular agenda? Seeing none, any member of council that would like to have an item removed from consent and placed on the regular agenda? Seeing none there either, what is the pleasure of council in regard to the consent agenda? Move to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Vreeman, is there support? Support. Support by Soul. any discussion? Seeing none, Brenda, would you please call the roll? Bird. Yes. Vreeman. Yes. Raymond. Yes. Corbin. Yes. Soul. Yes. Rowan? Yes. Shea? Yes. Schulteis? Yes. And Mayor Box? Yes. Motion passes. Great, thank you. Next item on the agenda is public comment. Under the Open Meetings Act of the State of Michigan, we provide the opportunity for the public to address council both at our regular meetings and our study sessions and frankly at every single board committee and commission meeting that we have. Uh, we do have guidelines that we ask you to follow. First, we ask you to come to the podium. Please state your name and the municipality in which you live. Uh, we do also limit your time to five minutes. There are three lights on the dais in front of me. There's a green light, a yellow light, and a red light. Green 
green light means you're doing well on time. Yellow light means you have one minute left. And when the red light turns on, your time has expired. And we are strict about that. Uh, we do want to make sure that you understand that this is one-way communication. This is the opportunity for you to speak to us about those things that you think are important. We don't answer questions or engage in discussion at this time. But if there is a question that can be answered by staff, they'll be able to circle around back to you, hopefully, and be able to get an answer to you for that. Uh, having said that, is there anyone here who would like to address council at this time? If so, please come forward. And would you please state your name and municipality for the record? Ann Henriksen, Zeeland. We are so pleased that National April Faith Month is declared in Holland, Michigan by the mayor of the city. Also, there will be a declaration for the National Day of Prayer for May 2nd. Please attend the breakfast. The deadline for the tickets is April 16th. Go to hollandpraise.org for, for these tickets. It is a step in the right direction to acknowledge our faith and our rights to, to both exercise and express our religious speech. So I have this evening uh, April Faith Month activities. The committee has gotten them together, so there's a program, and then your invitations to the National Day of Prayer, and we hope that you make it and get involved with these things. I represent those who believe in the Bible and the saving work of the resurrected Jesus Christ. We are not, we are not against anyone, but will stand and speak for our freedom to act accordingly to our beliefs without reprisal. Why do I mention this? It is because of the 2020 ordinance, which doesn't seem like it's, that's long past and nothing needs to be done. But I do want to speak to something that is very important. Um, we are having, and I've asked you to come to this, uh, basically it's the Restoring Faith in America, opening the door to fearless expression of faith. Restoring Faith in America is a new initiative launched by First Liberty Institute. Its purpose is to power, empower people of faith as they express their beliefs publicly without fear of government obstruction. The time is ripe for this new movement because the legal landscape has recently had many sweeping changes for the better. After decades of hard-fought courtroom, uh, courtroom battles, legal precedents that silenced religious expression and government acknowledgement of religion have finally been overturned. The law has overturned to our side. Americans can now enjoy higher levels of religious freedom than we've had in generations, but the average American is unaware of how drastically the laws have changed. Restoring faith in America is a central hub where people can learn their rights, take actions, get legal help, and share their stories of victory. Many of the unfair laws that were used for decades to suppress free expression of religion are now in the dustbin of law libraries. In fact, due to the recent rulings that allow more freedom of religious expression, many law books have suddenly become out of date and are having to be revised. But if people of faith don't take advantage of this fabulous opportunity, it would be like nothing changed. And it reminds me of the Emancipation Proclamation where they knew they weren't free, so they continued to be in slavery. With the launch of the RFIA, it's time to play offense and ex exercise our rights to public, publicly express faith. And so I've talked about something. I'll give you an example here in Holland. Um, the establishment here pretty much operates under the separation of church and state. That is no longer, it is, it, separation of church and state is a, a letter, okay, a historical. But what has happened here, it is used. So I'm going to explain two things here. Um, First of all, 2024, the Pride Celebration, I see you have the t-shirt, um, is going to be in Collin Park, supported by the city of Holland financially with our taxpayer uh, donations. What will we be performing in the Collin Bandshell? Drag queens? Will all the council attend it because it is a city-sponsored event? Will they bring their families or why won't they? 
In contrast, in the past, if a religious group requests the banshell, they were denied it and advised to use the grass areas. The policy of rental is an event must be sponsored, and then there is no instructions how to get your sponsorship. So most religious events that would require the band shell have been denied. Why? Separation of church and state. The laws have changed. And you need to look into this. You need to know what's going on. So, and the public, too, is aware. They're getting more and more aware of what's going on. And I will continue to advocate for our religious freedom. That is five minutes, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, your time has expired. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? And would you please state your name and municipality for the record? Martha Capistani Holland. All right, good evening, council. Um, I want to welcome the new members and congratulate the mayor on his third term. And I want to thank you for your service. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'm excited for April Faith Month and the activities that are planned, and I hope that you, many of you can attend some of these. I'd like to begin with this. If you are a follower of Jesus, he said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And we know that he also used much stronger warnings when it came to protecting children. I wish I was going to talk more about Faith Month, but there is a concern in the community for what potentially is coming in June. Last year during Pride Month, a new event was promoted. It was Drag Queen Story Hour. This has been pushed more and more all over the country. Fortunately, it was canceled due to public outcry, and legitimately so. For many, common sense would say that grown men dressed outlandishly like women while reading confusing stories of a sexual nature to children is just not appropriate, but common sense does not have the power that it used to. Many also feel that Drag Queen Story Hour is a form of grooming. The reason I say this is because this is now a well-organized group with over 40 chapters. They have a manifesto in which they are not afraid to put into print, and they call it a teaching method. They say exactly what their goal is and why they exist now, which is to engage with children younger and younger. Now, this literature was written by one of the drag queens that actually participates in this activity named Harry Kornstein, whose drag name is Little Miss Hot Mess. He is a leader and co-writer of this organization. Now, I'll read to you that uh, this is from the end of the abstract, and then I'll read you some of the first paragraph from the conclusion. Ultimately, the authors propose that drag pedagogy produces a performative approach to queer pedagogy, queer ideology. It is not simply about LGBTQ plus lives, but living queerly. And then near the conclusion it says, queer world making, including political organizing, has long been a project driven by desire. It is in part enacted through art forms like fashion, theater, and drag. And they go on to say, we believe that Drag Queen Story offers an invitation toward deeper public engagement with queer, excuse me, queer cultural production, particularly for young children and their families. It may be that Drag Queen Story Hour is family friendly in the sense that it is accessible and inviting to families with children, but it is less a sanitizing force than it is a preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship. There are people in the community, which include myself, that think Drag Queen Story Hour is inappropriate for children without any prior knowledge of the ideological and political agenda they are pushing, and that should be enough. But when I did more research, I was shocked. It says right in their literature that this is a fundamentally different orientation than the movement towards the inclusion or assimilation of LGBT people, not my words. In closing, drag was and will always be a misogynist be misogynistic at its core and sexual in its nature. It should remain adult entertainment, and it's not appropriate for kids no matter how they try to sanitize it. This is one of the most divisive issues being pushed onto communities, and it does nothing to promote acceptance and inclusion. In fact, it does the exact opposite. As a city council, I'm pleading with you, if you have any authority or influence, please discourage or stop this activity from coming to Holland. And I'm also asking, again, to please ensure strict age limits for adult shows. I know I speak for many who are afraid to speak up about this political agenda being aimed at children. Now, this is only a partial expose of the dangers of this ideology, and I have several copies of a deeper dive into this manifesto, if you'd like one. Now, I'm sure there are people participating in this that think, ah, oh, it's not that big a deal, but they don't realize that there's a great deception behind it. And I'll finish with one final quote from their literature, and you can judge for yourself if it makes you feel uncomfortable. We're reading books while we read each other's looks, 
and we're leaving a trail of glitter that won't ever come out of the carpet. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? And would you please state your name and municipality for the record? Good evening. I'm Catherine Ristola Bass from the city of Holland. I am the chair of the Human Relations Commission for this year, and I just want to express our deep appreciation for the city council and the administration and the staff that does all the heavy lifting of our city. Thank you for all your work. I particularly want to highlight acceptance and inclusion and accessibility for all. This is a big deal for the Human Relations Commission, and I was very excited to see the... Um, the questionnaire go out about possibility of further recycling in the city and downtown as a possibility. I'm excited that the city is, in, is looking at that. Currently, if I want to bring recyclable materials such electron, as electronics or styrofoam, I, when I'm already going to Grand Rapids for something, I have to go to Grand Rapids to dispose of electronics safely now that Compreneu closed down in town. So. I'm very thrilled that this could, is a step toward looking at even more accessibility for people who may not be able to go to dispose of things safely. And it's kind of expensive, too. Thank you again for all your work. Have a good evening. Great. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? <laughs> and I'm going to guess that you're one of our HIAC students. I am. And I have a couple of additional requirements for HIAC students, and I bet you've been prepped for that already. <laughs> We would love to know what school you go to, what grade you're in, what you're doing with Hayek, and if you have any plans for the future. And if you don't, that's okay, because I didn't have any at your age either. <laughs> um, my name is Juniper McDonald. I live in the city of Holland. I go to Black River, and I don't have any concrete plans for the future. Thank you. Um, my name is Juniper McDonald, and I'm a freshman at Black River Public School. An issue in our city that's important to me is the safety of kids around school areas specifically by my school. Black River is situated right next to the train tracks. Many times, there is a train that passes through at the exact time BR releases its students. I believe this to be a safety issue that we as a city can improve, improve upon. We should consider delaying the train between 2.45 and 3.20 p.m. or adding a safety gate as there is currently not one at that crossing. Finally, one more safety consideration is putting in a crosswalk at the south side of Prospect Park to protect small children while walking to school in the dark mornings. Thank you for your time and thank you for everything you do for this city. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? Good evening, and you know the requirements as well, I bet. Yeah. Yes. Um, my name is Molly Huggett. I live in Fenville. I go to Holland High, and right now I don't have any concrete plans for the future. Um, so hello, my name is Molly Huggett and I am on the Recreation Committee. I am here today to offer public comment about how we can make Holland more sustainable. Every year, thousands of people come to Tulip Time. There are so many tourists everywhere and a lot of different events, including the 5K race and multiple parades. Due to the large number of people, there is a huge amount of trash thrown away by the end of the festival, a lot of it being from people selling food around the area and empty water bottles from after the race. Although it might not seem like a big deal, with this huge amount of people visiting Holland throughout tulip time, there is an enormous amount of waste. A lot of what is thrown away could be recycled, but the city of Holland doesn't provide recycling bins or services for people to be able to recycle these things. For the past several years, I have worked with the green team at my school to make recycling available at the race. We had volunteers stand at the bins and direct people to put their trash and recycle in their respective bins to prevent contamination. This was a really simple job, and we were able to save so many pounds of recycling from going into the landfill. If the City of Holland chose to help organize this yearly and have recycling bins available throughout the duration of Tulip Time Festival, there would be so much recycling that would be diverted from going into landfills and it would make a big impact in our community. If we truly want to make Holland a more sustainable place for future generations, this is a small thing that we can do that would have a great impact. Thank you for your time and everything you do. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? Good evening, and same rules apply for you. Okay. Um, my name is Angel Venegas. I live in the city of Holland, and I am a senior. I'm a current senior. Um, and I do not have a current plan, but I, that's okay. Um, but um, I kind of just want to talk about today about, I've been reflecting as I near my graduation about the past four years of my life um, in high school um, and the fact that I've spent all those four years being a part of HIAC or Holland Youth Advisory Council. 
Um, and I just, so I, I am so thankful that the city of Holland has programs like that, that invest in the youth of our community um, and that we have a voice um, and the opportunity to be involved within city government. I know that's not a very common thing um, and I'm just so incredibly thankful for my ability to serve um, on the Human Relations Commission for the past four years. Um, and, and for the city of Holland for making such a wonderful community to be raised in. I was born here and I've lived here my entire life. And as I'm kind of looking towards moving out and going to try other things, um, I'm just so incredibly grateful that I was, um, that I was born into a city that truly, with a city council that truly cared um, about the people that lived in it. So I'm so incredibly thankful to all of you and to Joan, our program director. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council? Seeing none, I will close the public comment period. Next item on the agenda, item number seven, uh, special order of the day public hearings, uh, Act 425 Urban Cooperation Agreement with Fillmore Township. Mr. Van Beek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, and public present, and also watching from home. Um, with the mayor's and council's indulgence, um, we have two items on the agenda tonight that are uh, very closely related. And instead of trying to kind of um, deal with those separately uh, with a presentation that um, probably most people can figure out, we had a closed session on Monday night and um, we went through a legal agreement, but um, kind of was set up also to, to uh, present these items. So again, with mayors and council's indulgence, we'll give a presentation that really covers two items on the agenda. All right, I'm seeing head nods. So um, we'll go through this. I'm going to uh, begin and then I'm gonna call on two of my colleagues uh, to go into more detail on both. Uh, but again, uh, this relates to a project, LG Energy Solutions, um, and I'm gonna give a little context and background first. So the overview um, is that uh, for many people will remember that LG Energy Solutions was first a project that started, um, I should have the, na the, the year of right off the top of my head, 2000. 2010 was the date um, with phase one, uh, which we refer to. Um, more recently, we did an addendum to the development agreement, which is going to be discussed and recommended to you tonight for phase two. And this evening, we're talking about two different actions, a 425 agreement, but also a, a um, updated redevelopment agreement for what we're referring to as phase three. The overview for this um, was first talked about with council and in the public when an announcement was made October 4, 2023, that LG Energy had um, plans at that point to proceed. Um, and we've been working with them at a staff level, both at the BPW and at the city, and by extension, our local economic development organization Lakeshore Advantage and certainly at the state MEDC and then other entities like Fillmore Township and Allegan County um, um, as an entity been working towards their um, intention to build an additional plant. Um, at that point it was $2.5 billion investment of a 1.7 million square foot facility. I think both of those numbers have even crept up a little bit. I know that the applicants were in front of the Planning Commission last night to begin some process there. Um, some basics that we talked to council and talked publicly about going all the way back into October was that this particular phase, as opposed to phase one and phase two, does not include a renaissance zone, but we would expect and the indications are that um, would pursue at a later date, pending a lot of other approvals, including 
approvals that would be necessary tonight to pursue a 198 tax abatement, which is a more traditional type abatement that we do with industrial partners. Um, there's also a small section that's currently in Fillmore Township um, that would transfer into the city. Uh, and that's the 425 agreement that we'll outline here in a moment. Um, the indication back then is that the number of jobs already in phase one and committed to in phase two that's still in construction and hasn't opened yet is enough to cover um, phase three when that would come online also. Um, the redevelopment agreement that we're going to present to you tonight uh, um, also indicates the cost of infrastructure that's going in and LG's um, agreement to pay for that and also addressing various electric, electric customer concentration risk. So um, key elements that we're gonna go through tonight, we're gonna start with the 425 agreement and that actually is the first thing on your agenda. Um, then just to give context, because they're very interrelated, um, we're also going to talk in this presentation about the site plan review and zoning process, um, road improvements uh, that we're pursuing um, to support this additional phase. And then in the development agreement, um, elements including electric service, sanitary sewer service, um, payments for those improvements, a letter of credit process that um, grants the city um, and the BPW a level of assurance um, as we go through um, making significant improvements um, supporting this project and also the conveyance of real estate possibility uh, for some of that infrastructure. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mark Myers, our Community and Neighborhood Services Director, who is part of those duties, gets to deal with all things economic <laughs> development, and in this case, a 425 agreement. So thanks, Mark, for taking us through uh, right. this item. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, do we have a clicker, or are you going to be my? I'll be your you clicker. Do it? Wonderful. Thank you, Keith. Um, Again, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I'll try to be a bit brief tonight since you've been presented with this uh, previously, but for the public's benefit, thank you, sir. Um, real quick, at a high level, a 425 agreement uh, allows for economic development to occur um, over shared borders, in this case, between a city and a township. Um, Typically, the city has the means to provide essential services uh, necessary, in this case, for a manufacturing facility um, where the township does not. And also, uh, in return, the township is provided uh, tax revenue that it would otherwise receive uh, but for the, the 425. So uh, in this case, you see the map there. There's a small corner, northeast corner of uh, LG's campus, if you will. Um, plant three that has been announced, a portion of that plant will have to be built on what is currently township property. Um, so LG has purchased uh, three properties, um, including about 26 acres. And uh, we've come to an agreement with Fillmore Township, which they actually approved last week, um, to um, bring those properties into the city and then in return to uh, share some tax revenue. This is not a new uh, vehicle. We've done this again in 2010 and also 2012. So I want to make sure, I didn't do this the other night, but I want to make sure that I acknowledge Fillmore Township for cooperating with the city. Uh, in doing so, we both win because we retain a growing uh, employer in our community. Um, again, the property becomes the, um, or we become the taxing entity. Uh, we'll provide, again, the fire and police services and also the utilities, which Dave Coster will touch on. Uh, we'll be responsible for zoning the property. Um, and again, we'll provide utilities. Here's a closer look at the properties. If you look in that northwest corner, you see the properties uh, outlined there. And again, um, this includes a tax sharing um, agreement with the township. 
the three parcels um, at their current value um, will be uh, taxed and the township will receive that tax revenue. Uh, it will increase normally on an annual basis based on an inflation factor, which is uh, capped at, or which is CPI and capped at 5%. Um, the new growth from the new plant uh, will not um, be shared with the township. The city will uh, receive that new uh, industrial investment uh, value. Uh, the millage rate to the township is fixed at their current rate, which is 6.95 mills. Uh, it's a 50-year agreement. At, at the end of the 50 years, the tax sharing ends, and then the city takes complete control, if you will, uh, of that property. Um, with that, let's see if I've got, oh, I've got one more slide. So just to update you, um, again, uh, Keith mentioned that uh, the company was before the Planning Commission to discuss their uh, preliminary site plan. Um, that's pending right now. The site plan is going to have to wait um, until a 30-day referendum period, which if you approve the agreement tonight, will start tonight. Uh, once that period is over, then they can apply for a rezoning. Uh, we can't rezone property that's not currently within our jurisdiction. Uh, also, uh, Keith touched on road improvements. Uh, we have a pending grant before the uh, Michigan Department of Transportation. Uh, for a $3.5 million project to improve roads and intersections um, around the uh, uh, campus to facilitate the, the additional traffic. Uh, we hope to have an award in early May. And with that, um, I'll mention during this public hearing that we do have representatives of the company here, so if there are any questions uh, that you'd like to direct to the company, uh, they're available. With that, any questions? Any questions from council? Mr. Schulteis. Uh, thanks for the download. The, the $3.5 million grant mm -hmm. uh, that's <clears throat> in application, what happens if that doesn't uh, get approved or authorized? Thank you. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, so under the development agreement, which we'll get into next, uh, the company is required to pay the cost. So uh, if you recall, uh, there's a 20% local match, which they've agreed to pay. Um, and then the difference between whatever grant is received and the total cost of the project, they will also pay 100%. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great, thanks right. Mark. Thank you. Evening, All right. Dave. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council. It's great to be with you again um, and to support the work of the staff here in cooperation with LG towards this uh, new development. And so I'm going to pick up, <clears throat> excuse me, where Mark left off here and talk a little bit about utilities. But just a reminder, too, that what Mark covered are all elements of the development agreement. So 425 is a specific item tonight, but that also is, is called out in the development agreement as being, um, you know, that this development agreement is contingent, you know, on the 425 approval and also has the payment provisions associated with that road improvement, you know, laid out in it. But it also has obligations as it relates to utilities as well. And just as with phase one and two and now three, um, LG has provided us over time um, forecasts and requests for actual utility needs, um, whether it's electric, water, or wastewater. And attached to the development agreement are those applications for service, which we rely upon in the planning and development of infrastructure to serve the company. Um, and so in this particular case, there is a request for an additional 60 megawatts of electricity. That comes along with, on that campus, um, a retooling of phase one to bring it to nearly 24, or around 20 to 24 megawatts in size. And then phase two, in 2022, had a 73 megawatt request. In, after that request in 2022, and with the first amendment to the development agreement, we put in provisions that said that we would commit to building a substation to serve um, LG's needs for phase two. 
That's on the screen here in front of you. That's the East Point substation. It's about a $13 million substation. And in phase, uh, that phase, um, that, that, that uh, uh, first uh, amendment, we committed to first dollar on that subject to reimbursement you know, over a certain amount of time of electric usage, if there wasn't enough revenue generated, then there was a reimbursement for some of that cost uh, to us. In this phase, um, it's a lot more extensive than just a substation. Uh, if you look at the total demand now that's being accumulated in that site and also looking at not just the substation, which is that last point on the interconnection to the customer, but also backing up and looking at the entire infrastructure for the utility, there are other elements that are um, going to need to be upgraded as well. We are looking at that right now. We have a consultant that's working with us to do power flow studies both inside of our system as well as doing transfer studies to look at how much could be imported as we run out of our internal generating capacity and have to rely upon bringing more power in uh, to serve LG. What does that look like as well in terms of externally Michigan Electric Transmission Company's ability to do that? What we have estimated at this point, and it is, it is an estimate, um, but that we have nearly $50 million in just upgrades for our system. That would be another substation, and the costs um, continue to go up as supply chain continues to be uh, impacted uh, on the electric um, components. Uh, matter of fact, just a little example of that, um, transformers that we purchased for this substation um, a couple of years ago were 3.4 million. We just opened bids on that. It was about $6.7 million um, for those same, same transformers. And so there's a lot of pressure on uh, uh, pricing on that as well as availability. Uh, and then we're also looking at on various elements of the infrastructure, up, upgrading conductors and uh, switches and breakers at various points along the um, uh, distribution loop in our system. That is inside of the BPW's uh, service territory. And then as I mentioned, we also have the uh, potential with the uh, request for power to reach an amount at some point where we're gonna be needing to upgrade and ask for new transmission service to be provided from a Michigan Electric Transmission Company. We won't know exactly what upgrades are needed until we actually make a request for that transmission service. We don't want to make a request for transmission service until we actually need the power because otherwise you're starting to pay for that transmission service and not actually needing it. So what we're doing is looking at studies that give us a pretty good estimate of what we think is going to be impacted at the time that we would reach on that. And so the development agreement contemplates the fact that we have some early stage improvements and then also there may be some time lag to where we're actually going to need to do some things with Michigan Electric Transmission Company as well. And that is covered from an infrastructure standpoint in the development agreement. And different from the last time around where we paid for the substation subject to reimbursement, here with the cash flow needs again right on the heels of the other development, we felt that that was not really sustainable from the electric utility standpoint to be able to do that again. So the development agreement really contemplates now that LG is paying first dollar on that. And what we will do is we will actually accumulate the element, uh, the portion of the delivery rate from LG over a five year period of time. And then whatever that usage actually does generate it, it, in conjunction with our normal process with new customers where we do a contribution in aid of capital construction, we would actually reimburse them on the on the back end of that, okay? And we'll talk about payment process here in a little bit um, going forward, but that's electric uh, and in terms of the infrastructure, but it's also important to talk about the service of electricity. And uh, there we have addressed things even with phase two. Um, as you know, we spent a lot of time as a staff studying um, the concept of customer concentration risk. Phase two alone had the potential, if it fully realized, of adding about 42% to our annual energy um, supply needs for our utility. And as one customer, LG between phase one and phase two, could be close to 30, 35 to 37% of our total service after that is uh, up and running. Phase three, brings that number closer to around 50%. And so with one entity, when you're looking at infrastructure for moving the power to them, that has its own risks, but those risks are actually relatively smaller 
than what it would be to actually invest in new power generation resources or long-term power supply uh, to serve an entity that had um, that much uh, concentration. If something were to happen where the load didn't materialize or, or, the, or the demand shifted over time, that could leave the utility in a situation where it has stranded assets at a, at a time when the market maybe is not going to fully realize the value of those stra stranded assets, which would be an impact to our other ratepayers. So this board, our board at the BPW and this council um, have uh, taken action on a uh, tariff that is, uh, applies to all customers that would be over a certain size. Um, LG projects to be over that size. When we look at the three fa facilities treated as one customer on that one campus, we're over a certain amount of power delivered in any hour. They're moving into a market-based um, uh, rate for that, for that energy. So within the first 30 megawatts in every hour, a bundled rate just like all of our other industrial customers pay and then over 30 that's a pass-through both in terms of demand costs and the energy costs that go along with that. So as this new facility gets added to the um, total demand it's going to be more power on that market-based threshold um, and continues to be something that helps mitigate the cost and risks to the, the Holland BPW by essentially passing through from the wholesale market um, you know, power to, uh, to LG Energy Solution. And, and so that is um, the structure in which we put in place. And we've done this in the context of a changing environment at the state level too, where just this last year, new energy legislation was put in place that is gonna put more requirements on the Holland BPW and other entities um, in the state of Michigan by 2030 with new milestones at 2035 and again at 2040 for renewable and clean energy standards. And so along with that, we want to make sure that we have a relationship with LG where we're going to be able to make those commitments that are Holland BPW commitments through the provisions that are allowed in that law. And the law does allow when there is a large customer that has a concentration uh, risk to a utility, um, municipal utility, that there's an ability to have the customer acquire renewable energy credits that the utility can use to meet its compliance obligations. And so we want to make sure that the um, development agreement took that into consideration and had the necessary elements in it to protect us um, in, in, to meet those, those needs going forward. And so now with that, LG is obligated to acquire renewable energy credits for its entirety of its load. For things that we, for power that we're serving under the bundled portion of the rate, the up to 30 megawatts, we know that that's something we have embedded in our rate structure is our obligations for renewable energy credits ourselves. So there is a payment back to LG to compensate them for RECs that are related to our obligations within the bundled portion of the rate as well. And so that is, that is a, a concept that is in the, the rate structure. All of this, again, working to try to create an opportunity to, uh, for uh, LG to create their own profile um, from an electric supply standpoint, but also to, to not take on a disproportionate burden of risk for the BPW and its other ratepayers in this structure. So that's what's been put in place earlier and it continues, will continue with this, with this service. In the area of wastewater, um, there also are some needs for infrastructure improvement here based upon, again, the application for service and the estimated flows. There's both an extension in 40th Street of a collection main, but then also uh, downstream from that, there is actually an upsizing in order to accommodate those flows in conjunction with the other flows that are currently on the system. So there's an estimate of about $2 million to do both the extension and the upsizing. That again is contemplated in the development agreement to be a first dollar um, uh, uh, spend or a, essentially a full, full uh, requirement of, of LG to fund that completely, frankly. Um, and, uh, and so that would be, uh, to take care of that, that would be the, the necessary investment LG's making there. Additionally, uh, they may have certain um, infrastructure on site that is needed from a monitoring standpoint or potentially a lift stations. Those are obligations that they would fund as well as paying what's called trunkage fees. And trunkage fees are an assessment, a part of an assessment that allows for the, um, the new growth that they're providing to provide a fund for future expansion um, which is a normal process, again, for any new development that is hooking up to the system, you know, they would pay based upon the meter sizes involved with those, those uh, connections. 
So again, a lot of costs here. We're talking about um, between road and uh, electric utility and wastewater utility, north of $50 million of investment, plus whatever Michigan Electric Transmission Company you might have down the road. So we want to make sure that, uh, number one, uh, that we are designing and building the system to utility standards that we do um, in all of our other applications. Uh, so we're going to follow those good utility practices. We're going to make it very operable with the rest of our system. It's going to be integrated just like the rest of our system. But there's an obligation then uh, for LG to follow on the heels of any commitments that we've made and obligations of cash flow or um, uh, other funding that we've essentially committed and are obligated to those providers to be able to, on the heels of that, make us whole uh, within a very short period of time. And so it's kind of a synchronized process of cash flow contemplated here where um, essentially within 30 days we're receiving the cash that we have obligated, both the city in terms of their work and the utility. Um, and so to support that, as, as Keith mentioned earlier, there's also additional security involved. So after 21 days, if we haven't received those funds, there's a, uh, a notice of default, nine days to cure that if that doesn't happen. So again, that 30-day time frame, there's a letter of credit that needs to be provided in the amount of the estimated work that is outstanding. And um, as that estimate changes, the letter of credit needs may change. As we expend funds, that letter of credit may come down over time. But essentially, that allows us to have the security that if something doesn't happen on a cash flow standpoint, we have another entity standing behind that so that we're not sitting there with obligations to contractors and vendors that are supplying materials and not having an ability to, to make those cash flow payments. It also, another provision, again, because of the timing of transmission service maybe being down the road a ways, you know, depending upon how LG ramps up all of their electric uh, demand on site, it may be a couple years until we're actually making a, a request for that transmission service as we run out of our internal generation. Um, and so it may be a, a little time down the road. So we want to make sure that, that also that letter of credit uh, concept survive that. And, and so that is a provision that is within the development agreement amendment as well. And then finally in the development agreement, um, again, because in that area, if you look around, um, land for a substation is not um, very easy to just identify a number of different uh, potential parcels. There is an option here, and again, it's an option, not a, not a demand, but an option that LG uh, may actually provide the BPW um, with a site that they want to consider conveying to us for a substation. There is a provision in there for due diligence that we that will then do, and then within our sole determination uh, to determine whether it's suitable or not. And if that, is, if that happens, then there is a transfer, a permanent transfer, a property to us so that we actually have a site that we would own at that point for a substation. But again, that is not a guarantee that that's the process we're going to go through. If we don't, we go through our normal process in developing new infrastructure by looking at property along with materials you know, that would be needed to actually build the infrastructure that's needed to deliver the electricity. So um, and with that, I think that is the last um, slide in the slide deck, so I'm sure that Keith or Mark or I would be happy to answer any questions that you have on, on the development agreement amendment as a whole. Questions from council members? Mr. Corbin. In relationship to monitoring the sewer, what, what, what mechanisms do we have to do that with the new infrastructure being? Right, so um, uh, when a, an entity that has a, a certain size and a certain potential to um, emit, there is an application process for sewer that will be, be part of um, you know, the, the site planning process, the design process, and, and the permitting process uh, that is going to be um, handled over the coming, you know, coming months. But there will be an identification of whether they trigger an actual sewer permit application, which will identify certain constituents and monitoring that we may be doing for the, for the size of customer they are. There has to be a manhole available to our um, staff to be able to go and do independent analysis of the effluent and be able to uh, have that surveillance access that's there. And so that is what's really contemplated with that piece of it. But there also may be elevation issues there on site, and that's where lift stations may also be needed based upon 
however the the effluent is coming out of the site and getting into the getting into the um, the wastewater collection system so if additional if the sampling determines there's additional need to do some type of um, mediate remediation with with regard to the, the waste would that require or would there be something that would allow us to require yeah. additional what is the treatment facilities right on site? so our ordinances have um, very um, specific limitations on what we call compatible and non-compatible pollutants um, the non-compatible pollutants we have um, concentration thresholds and those are typically your metals and things like that and so by ordinance they have to have levels that meet um, essentially the um, what's called our local limit study that determines what the issues would be in terms of toxicity and, and, and safety to the collection system as well as the plant you know at the at the far end and so those are protective in ordinance that, that are there those are limits that way and then there are things that are called compatible pollutants like biochemical oxygen demand and suspended solids and phosphorus and things like that where if they reach a certain amount they can be allocated a, a certain um, uh, surchargeable strength and again once an entity reaches 10 percent and we don't anticipate that for this potential um, type of use usually that's more in the food processing area where you have that kind of strength of waste but we limit again very similar to the electric rate we limit any one customer to no more than 10 percent of the available um, treatment capacity for industrial discharges at our water reclamation facility and if it gets to that point then some sort of pretreatment you know might be needed at, at that point but again ordinance really dictates that and controls that mr freeman dave you always impress me with your just vast knowledge and depth of detail so thank you once again i'm wonder i'm particularly interested in the electrical piece yeah. um and in our if i understand it correctly we are producing this much today and only utilizing a lower amount, we're able to then sell into the grid. Correct. Um, yeah. Going forward in this arrangement, I've heard you say a couple times that this arrangement is going to max us out and that we're gonna have to purchase electricity from somewhere else. I'm wondering if you can speak to are just the residents. Sure. I think we have a lot of confidence with you and your leadership and your team of all this other stuff. I go, electric is something I need. And how's that gonna affect us yeah. as residents? Are we gonna see changes or are there risks there? No, I, I think again, we've done a lot to, uh, and if I can back, I don't know if I can back up or not. Oh, go, yeah, it's all right. Um, if I can go back to this uh, slide right here, and it's maybe a little bit tough to see, right? But um, talk to the residents, talk to the other businesses, and we've had conversations with the other businesses because there has been you know, some, some concern expressed about you know what our portfolio situation is and and yes we've enjoyed some surplus after having built Hall Energy Park um, you know going into LG's expansions we've had you know somewhere around I would say uh, 50 to 60 megawatts of surplus capacity within our portfolio it's changing because part of that surplus capacity is 10 megawatts from the uh, um, plant up the road in Port Sheldon that we get uh, Campbell uh, plant through Michigan Public Power Agency which is coming offline next year there are other changes in our portfolio that are happening every day we bring to you new solar um, uh, purchases as well and we'll continue to plan long-range planning for every customer that we have and for the bundled portion of the rates that are in service to LG and any other situ similarly situated entity that has more than 30 megawatts of power. So it's not like we're not planning for LG at all. We're planning for the 30 megawatts of there that are represent about 10% of our um, capacity today. But over and above that, we're not making long-term commitments. Essentially what this diagram really contemplates is that from an energy perspective, the next day, there is a day ahead market that the grid operator you know, operates in our area and they provide a pricing. Every hour there's a new price, a wholesale price. Today, that price is very low actually because natural gas prices are low and demand is fairly low. And so things are really good you know, as far as the wholesale market today, but it has more volatility in it, right? And, and so we're not gonna take those long-term commitments on that, we're gonna pass through tomorrow's pricing essentially to the customer that is over 30 megawatts in size so the residents don't face that risk you know they're not taking on our long-term commitment risk you know if we didn't do this in the tariff 
um, that we've created. Essentially, we could find ourselves in a position where we're making 20, 30 year, or maybe even building new power plant um, type of commitments. And if something were to happen, you know, we would have a situation where we'd have to hope that the market is actually fairly and, and substantially compensating us for those investments. And, and that is a risk that with 50% of our power going to one entity right now is too much. Um, and that's what the board and the council have judged is that that's too much. And that's why we've done this um, bifurcation of the rate to say over 30 megawatts, you know, that is something now that we're gonna say no long-term commitments on that. I think that has gone a long way um, to really mitigating the risk of this investment. On the, on the infrastructure side, again, there's very little risk to us because first dollar is being paid by LG, and then we're accumulating the delivery portion of their rate based upon what they actually use and going to compensate them after five years based upon that delivery portion of the rate. So again, right in line with our policy on contribution and aid construction, but a very low risk involvement of that because instead of us paying it up front and then hoping that they use it or trying to seek some sort of reimbursement later if they don't, here they're making the first investment, we're collecting the amount and giving it to them based upon what they actually use. So again, both on the energy supply and on the infrastructure, we have de-risked it about as much as we possibly could. And so I think for our other businesses uh, in the area, for our residents, Yes, and we are, the, though, at a point where um, we still have a resource adequacy obligation, and so I don't want to get, I know it's not to get too, too technical here, but yes, we have to go out and make sure that we have enough power under contract or under ownership to meet our peak demand plus a reserve margin, and that includes the amount that we're going to be passing through. But those obligations only last in the state of Michigan for about four years, so we have to look four years out. And the way the tariff is designed is that whatever we end up having to pay for going out and securing that in a bilateral contract is what gets passed through to LG. And so it's basically um, keeping us whole on that uh, element of it. So again, there are certain things that under constructs of the state, you know, that happen under legislation, like the clean energy law or through this resource adequacy construct, we've worked as hard as we possibly can to make sure that we've minimized you know, the risk proposition uh, to our other residents and, and primary manufacturers in the area. Okay. Well, thank you for just explaining that further. And I just appreciate, and I know our city residents do, the broad and the narrow perspective that you have in these conversations and leading and uh, working with LG and, the, and their partnership with us as well. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for staff? Soul. So you talked about the rates um, and there was no way to project and we didn't want to do it well. You don't want to ask for the bundle rates because then you have to start paying. Is there any way to foresee how the, how the rates? Yeah, just to clarify, that's the transmission element. So right. um, we buy transmission because we have so much gen generation inside Holland. There are two ways of buying transmission. We buy it as we need it. And so we haven't needed a lot of it. Um, and we won't for a little while because we ha still have enough uh, surplus capacity in Holland where it's gonna be a couple of years until that happens. So we try to forecast as much as we can what upgrades are gonna be needed and our consultant is working on that, but it won't be precise because there are new investments that are being made in the grid every day. There are new generators that are coming on and offline. And so when a time comes for them to evaluate how much power can flow into Holland, they will do a power supply or power flow analysis at that time that we make an application and they will look at whether or not we're, that power is going to overload any elements out there in the external grid. And if it does, they're going to say those facilities need to be upgraded and here's the cost involved with that. And it would be assigned to Holland at that time. Should we do that today? They will tell us what upgrades are needed and those upgrades could be made, but we then will have to start paying for transmission service today mm -hmm. when we don't have that need for it yet because we still have that amount of internal generation. So it's a way of trying to signal to LG through our consultant and, and engineering work as much clarity as we can provide without actually making the commitment until the time comes that we need to make, make that commitment. 
if that these, helps. So those rates, I get it. You don't want to request it until you need it. But do these rates, I, I mean, ebb and flow, like with the economy, inflation, or I mean, no, no, the, the rates, kind of the rates don't so much. It's it's a matter of you're either paying for it or you're not. Okay. And so the rates are a uh, uh, controlled by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and so they are established based upon the infrastructure investment that Michigan Electric Transmission Company is making. I'm not going to say it's flat because it does change over time, but again, it's um, something that is uh, not a matter of whether the rates have a lot of mm -hmm. fluctuations. It's more a matter of you don't want to pay for it until you actually start needing to use it. It's, right. it's more that issue. Well, thank you for helping me understand yeah. that. I appreciate it. Good. Thank you for your question. Other questions? Devin? Oh, just really quick. I uh, just want some numbers. Uh, our capacity and how much they, uh, the LG is predicting to use, and then I, rate K is after 30 megawatts, correct? Right, so I mean, our, our total capacity, we've been, we've been surplusing um, and selling externally roughly 50, 60 megawatts of, of power. We have a peak demand of around 235 megawatts, so it's, it, it, it gets complicated, Devin, because you, you not only have to like, look at your peak load, but you have to look at the, the reserve margin that the grid operator makes you also cover. And so, you know, we're, we're somewhere near 300 or a little north of 300 megawatts of, of capacity for generation between what we own and the contracts in um, solar and landfill gas and, and the other assets that are outside of Holland through Michigan Public Power Agency. So it's a, it's a portfolio that really sure. provides that. So, you know, when you get to the 30 megawatts, it's not that we're out of generation at that point. Right. Um, but um, what we are doing, though, is we are starting to get into a point where um, – if we were to start providing um, long-term fuel supply to the assets inside Holland, or we were still buying a more advantageous product outside of Holland, we're still making longer-term commitments for that. And it's just a matter that the 30 megawatts really con constitutes about 10% of our overall um, usage at that point. Sure. And so, you know, above the 10%, that's what collectively the board and the council have determined as being a threshold where you know, we, we want to transfer that risk. We don't want to wear that risk, essentially. Sure. And so it's not so much that we're out of generation at 30 megawatts, but we're starting to get to a point where we're beyond 10% of our energy supply. Great. Thanks. Yep. Other questions? Mr. Van Beek. So I'm sure you uh, could and would do this, Mayor, but maybe just a system check because there's been a lot of information mm -hmm. and you allowed us to really make um, a presentation on two different items because mm -hmm. I think it brings value to both of those items. But um, maybe to, to go back, the first thing that we're gonna do um, is actually we're gonna oh, go sorry. back further. I went the wrong way. Yeah, is, is the hold a public hearing mm -hmm. as required by law mm -hmm. um, as it relates to the 425, which is a public act which is that urban cooperation agreement. And Fillmore Township has already acted upon this. And um, they, just like us, there's a 30-day referendum period. So what our recommendation is to hold the public hearing, then to take action on the 425 agreement, which authorizes the officials to execute that but we actually won't execute that until after the 30-day referendum period would pass. And that is the item maybe to just bring us back down into what's in front of, front of you right now is a public hearing and then to take action on that 425 agreement. Okay. Any other questions for staff before we, I open the public hearing? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, with that, then I will open a public hearing in regard to the Act 425 Urban Cooperation Agreement with Fillmore Township. Is there any member of the public that would like to address council in regard to the 425 Agreement with Fillmore Township? Seeing none, I will close the public comment, or excuse me, close the public hearing on this item. Uh, what is the pleasure of council in regard to the 425 Urban Cooperation Agreement with Fillmore Township? Motion to approve agenda item seven alpha as recommended. Move, moved by Schulteis, support by Freeman? Corbin. Corbin, support by Corbin, any discussion? I didn't recognize your voice there, Scott, sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's been two weeks, so. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none. Brenda, would you please call the roll? Yes. Freeman? Yes. Raymond? Yes. 
Corbin. Yes. Soul. Yes. Rowan. Yes. Shea. Yes. Schulteis. Yes. Bird. Yes. Mayor Box. Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. I'm going to take a quick detour before we get to the second piece of this, uh, and that's item number nine, written petitions and communications. Uh, in addition to providing an in-person public comment period, we do also have an email address uh, where we have members of the public, excuse me, um, be able to communicate directly with council. That is public comment at cityofholland.com. Uh, we do review those emails and then accept them into the record at our regular meetings. And we do have one uh, in this meeting. And I would ask and uh, entertain a motion for council to accept that communication into the record. Move to accept communications in record. Moved by Bird. Is there support? Support. Support by Soul. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, on to the second half, item 12E2.1, the second amendment to the development agreement with LG Energy Solution Michigan Incorporated. Mr. Van Beek, do you want to run through that entire presentation again? What do you think? I would, I would suggest no. Okay. Yeah. Um, any, any questions or comments uh, that council has in regard to this particular item? I actually do, so, and I'd, I'd love to, Dave, would you be willing to come back up here for me? Because there's a lot going on here. I just, I just want to, because you, you have done such a great job of describing this in such detail that I'm worried that, that some members of the public may have gotten lost in the You're going to restate it for me, in the force. I am. Yeah. I thought that's what Mr. Van, Van Beek was, <laughs> was teasing me with. But I, I, I really want the public to understand yeah. kind of what the major elements of this are. Thank you. So for, first piece of this is what we just voted on, which is we've, we have agreed, uh, if we get through this 30-day referendum period, that we're going to be taking some property in from Fillmore Township. Fillmore Township is going to continue to receive the same, essentially the same tax dollars that they were receiving on that property for the next 50 years with a five, uh, an increase every single year up to 5%. But then we are going to be receiving the incremental change in the property taxes on that property, which is going to be likely to be significantly more than what's being taxed on it at this point. That's correct. correct. Okay. Um, then the next, the next piece of this is LG Energy Solutions is going to build about a 2 million square foot addition to the plant that they have, but because of smart factory technology, no additional jobs are likely to be generated because of that, correct? That's correct. And in, and in this kind of weird economic time that we're in, um, it's it's unusual, I think, for a mayor to say, I'm, I'm kind of happy that there aren't any additional jobs here because we have such a... a uh, a low unemployment rate in this community and housing is an issue that we're in a different time period we might be might be saying we'd really like to see some additional jobs coming from this from the from our standpoint from the public standpoint it's a, a, a good thing that those those jobs that have been uh, projected from the previous phases are actually going to be spread out over this so I wanted to make that point very clear to the public as well that's a good point um, because of this lar large infrastructure uh, improvement there's going to be a large uh, a need for additional electricity, which I'm not going to get into the numbers because council did a great job getting into the numbers with you with that. And Mr. Mr. Freeman, I'm glad he asked the question that he asked about security for the current for sure. our current rate payers that people can feel very confident about the fact that this is not going to impact their service. This is not going to impact their rates. And but what I really wanted to focus on with you is the fact that you came up with an, a, a way. You and your staff came yeah. up with a way to one be able to provide that additional capacity in a way that protects not only the infrastructure that we have in place, but also our ratepayers. And one thing that was mentioned, but I'm, I think may have gotten lost in the weeds of all of this, that also helps us with our community energy plan. It does. That, that it provides us an opportunity for, for the purchase of renewable energy credits that we would not have had the opportunity to be able to purchase. And it actually puts us in a better position in regard to the greenness of the city of Holland, even though we actually have a... Have a um, industrial user that's using more electricity, it provides an opportunity for more renewable energy credits. Correct. It's really nice to know that you have a partner working with you that is as committed to the environment as, as the community is. Ab absolutely. And then the, the last piece of this has to do with the infrastructure because one of the things 
that we really love about the BPW is the reliability of the service that the BPW provides, and that's because we've got great infrastructure. And I really wanted to applaud you and your team for assuring the fact that we did the construction on the substation. We are making sure that all of the improvements that need to be done are being done up to the standards that the people of the City of Holland and the Board of Public Works ratepayers um, have come to expect. Um, but yet, there's not a cost associated that with that for our ratepayers. That that's something that is being paid for by LG, and that you've done a great job in securing that. And if anybody thinks that's kind of unusual, that LG is um, is paying for those, those infrastructure changes. Anytime you want to get an upgrade to the electrical in your own home, you're paying for the cost of that infrastructure. Yeah. Again, the same contribution and native capital construction applies to every customer. We look at the incremental revenue that's involved, and if the incremental revenue does not cover the cost of the upgrade, any customer is responsible for that. Exactly. And the, the last analogy I wanted to use this, and I apologize, Council, but I like to do these kind of things for the for the public to be able to understand. As we said with phase two, this is a big project. Um, this is a huge construction project and an awful lot of infrastructure. But one of the things that we talked about in regard to phase two, um, we mentioned the movie Hoosiers. And if you remember the movie Hoosiers where the small town Indiana basketball team gets into the state finals and they show up at the incredibly large, imposing stadium where they're going to have to play this game. And in order to bring everybody back down to earth, the coach pulls out a tape measure and measures the court and says, it's the exact same court you've always been playing. And one of the things that I really appreciated about staff in regard to phase two was that we followed every single process, every single procedure that we have here in the city of Holland to make sure that we do things well, we do things right, and we do things to the standard that our taxpayers and our ratepayers expect from us. And so thank you for that with this and with phase two and all of the staff at City Hall and the BPW. Um, it is wonderful to be able to sit in these chairs and have the incredible level of confidence that we do in the people that work here um, in being able to put together something as big as this, as complicated as this is, in a way that serves the people of the City of Holland very Thanks, well. Mayor. So appreciate, appreciate that. It. Thank you. Yep. What is the pleasure of Council in regard to this item? Move to approve. Uh, we've got a motion to approve item 12E 2.1. Is there support? Support. Support by, moved by Soul, Wait, support by Bird. Any discussion? Cor correction, Mr. Mayor. You said 2.1. I believe it's 2.2. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope. No, two point one. Two point one. Twelve e. Oh, is it different on the on the the? Yeah, it looks like we just so. So, just uh, what? So, just to clarify, we're talking about the second amendment to the development agreement with LG Energy Solution Michigan Incorporated. So, we've got a motion to approve that second amendment. We've got a, we've got support. Do we have any discussion? Nope. All right, Brenda, would you please call the roll? Raymond. Yes. Corbin? Yes. Soul? Yes. Rowan? Yes. Shea? Yes. Schultes? Yes. Bird? Yes. Freeman? Yes. Mayor Box? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Next item on the agenda, 12E 6.1, gifts. Brenda, would you please review the gifts for us? The city manager's office is pleased to report the following gift. The department of Public Safety Services Police Operations received a donation of $240 through the sale of medallions for the Police Honor Guard program. It's recommended this donation be accepted with appreciation, credited to the appropriate account, and an expression of gratitude be forwarded to the donors. Great. Thank you. What is the pleasure of Council in regard to the gifts? Move to approve said gifts with a token of our appreciation. Moved by Soul. Is there support? Support by Vreeman. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda, item 12E6.2, finance. Proposed fiscal year 2025 budget for review and setting of a public hearing on May 1, 2024. Mr. Van Beek. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council. And I'm going to suggest that because we have a study session uh, after this meeting and another one tomorrow, specifically on this item. Um, I, I will refrain from giving you an introduction and an overview of the entire budget, other than saying that all of the documents supporting that in large and small ways, whether that be a budget and brief document, 
or an entire 268 or 269 page budget is included there. Uh, we have open to the public uh, study sessions tonight and tomorrow going through that. And then um, obviously the item before you is setting a public hearing um, for further opportunity for public input um, before um, recommended and hopefully adopted budget in May. Great, thank you. Any questions for staff? What is the pleasure of council in regard to uh, setting the public hearing for the proposed fiscal year 2025 budget for review? Motion to approve 12 echo 6.2 as written. Moved by Schulteis, is there support? Support. Support by Sol, any discussion? Seeing none, Brenda, would you please call the roll? Corbin? Yes. Sol? Yes. Rowan? Yes. Shea? Yes. Schulteis? Yes. Bird? Yes. Freeman? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Mayor Box? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Next item, item 13, communications from the city manager. Mr. Van Beek? Yes. Uh, five things quickly tonight, I promise, uh, at least at this stage. One, my apologies. Um, overlooked something that um, I'm surprised that we did. Um, I know the mayor is planning to read a proclamation momentarily. Normally that would be on the agenda. Not sure how um, we overlooked that, I overlooked that. So that will be mm -hmm. um, done by the mayor here momentarily. Um, good news yesterday from Ottawa County in that the Ottawa County road millage renewal uh, was approved to be uh, put on the ballot by the Ottawa County um, Board of Commissioners. So that is good news as it's one other item uh, that we certainly utilize as the city as a way to utilize um, tax dollars very well and efficiently uh, to support um, our, our roads. Um, so that will be an item on the ballot on August 6th. Uh, we already talked that we have budget study sessions both tonight and tomorrow. Uh, next week, again, because of the strangeness of spring break, we actually have back-to-back -back regular council meetings. So next week, Wednesday night, we have an additional council regular meeting. Um, and then hopefully, I haven't heard otherwise, um, and if you do, and you don't have to say it now, but if you would let me know, uh, on the 24th, April 24, we are looking to have a study session. At this point, we're still looking for an opening and we're shooting for that would be the night that we would go over the Colby results that all of you take it. But we really want to do that on a night where all of you are present. So um, you'll have to let me know if someone's not going to be able to be there because then we'll have to bump that back. And that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda. Excuse me. <coughs> Appointments and communications from the mayor. Uh, now I'm losing my voice. Apologize, and as, as you said, Mr. Van Beek, I do have a proclamation this evening. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Whereas, faith is an integral part of American life, and the residents of Holland represent faith traditions from every part of the world. And whereas, we recognize the founder of Holland, Reverend Albertus Christian Van Ralty, and the community of Dutch Calvinist separatists came to Holland for a better way of life and to fully express their faith. And whereas the individual freedom to express our faith is a cornerstone of our great nation and protected under the United States Constitution. And whereas the freedom to express our faith has helped create and sustain our city, state, and nation with religious vitality and diversity. And whereas persons of every faith from every corner of the world continue to seek better lives and freedom to worship free from persecution here in Holland, and whereas people of faith find hope in their traditions in times of crisis and uncertainty, and whereas as a city we acknowledge the tradition and strength of each person's faith as we make decisions for today and the future to strengthen and grow our community. Now therefore I, Nathan Box, Mayor of the City of Holland, Michigan, and members of the Holland City Council do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Faith Month. We encourage all people of faith to observe, reaffirm, and celebrate the religious diversity of our great nation, to worship in their own tradition, seeking truth and strength from God to face the problems of today, and to give thanks for the access and opportunity to worship, 
pray, meditate, and practice their faith in their own manner. We invite members of our community to gather as they choose, to pray and meditate for our national, state, and local governmental leaders, for, and for wisdom to lead Holland on the paths of justice, peace, and goodwill for all people. Given under my hand and the seal of the City of Holland, this 10th day of April, 2024, Mayor Nathan Box. And that is all I have this evening. Uh, next item on the agenda, appointments, motions, communications from City Council members. Anything from Council this evening? Seeing none, uh, just one motion I would entertain at this time. Move to adjourn. Moved by Vreeman, is there support? Support. Support by Raymond, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned and we will be heading upstairs for the budget study session. So we will see the members of Council up there in a few minutes.